Okay, good evening everyone. Simon Jacobson here. I welcome everybody as well as the web audience <coughs> to another uh, exciting episode of Wednesday Night Live. <laughs> um, we hope it will be exciting. Uh, so, as I have discussed many times here, and um, the mystics amongst you are aware that uh, time equals energy. The Jewish perspective on time, the Jewish mystical perspective on time, is that time is energy. In the last century, Einstein and modern discoveries in physics come to confirm that idea, but that concept goes back literally thousands of years to the classic work called the Zohar and based on the Bible how the Zohar interprets certain verses in the book of Genesis which I won't go into here in detail because it's not so relevant to our main subject is that time equals energy. Now that's not a small statement because time could have also be seen as a uh, imaginary concept that people create simply to keep uh, score, to keep count of their days and weeks and uh, minutes and hours. But as I said, in physics, we know today that just like space is a real entity, so too is time. It's invisible to the naked eye. So you have the poetic different expressions of the river of time, the flow of time. But the fact is, time is a form of energy. And... In this mystical perspective, the energy of time is one that works like a spiral, which means it's not like a river of time running linearly from past to the present to the future, which would mean like a long river of time, and yesterday was there, and today is here, and tomorrow is there. But it's actually like a spiral. Think of it like a spring, which is circular, meaning that time repeats itself and comes back to the same axis except at a different plane so like a spring when you say a circle for instance when you say something is circular so circular would mean literally it's just repeating the same orbit again and again like the orbit of the planet but time has an orbit the energy of time but its orbit never exactly repeats itself but but it goes back to the same point but at a different uh, in a different plane like a spring so if you think of a spring, it, it returns to the same spot, but it's at a little lower or different place in the, in the context of things. Now, this is a, maybe a bit abstract, but if you think of it in practical terms, let's say you take your birthday, to those that have a birthday these days, or any time, everyone, ha everyone here has a birthday, right? Some people don't like to celebrate their birthday, but everybody has a birthday. Um, so a birthday, the consequences of this idea of time being energy is that on your birthday, you're not just commemorating something that happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or whatever your age may be, but you actually are reliving, like the spiral, the same events, the same energy that flowed the moment you arrived on this earth, repeats itself every year that same birthday. So in other words, the same energy is recreating itself. And this is really the significance of holidays, of the Shabbat, of the Jewish calendar in general, that when a holiday comes, they're not just remembering and commemorating events that happened on this day 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, but we're actually able to relive it. In the words of the Arizal, another great Kabbalist, Hayomim ha'el in v'nasim. It's from the book of Esther that we read on Purim. So the expression is, these days shall be remembered and they shall be enacted. So he asked the question, it should say, these days should be remembered. What's the additional word, venasim, which means they should be reenacted? So on a very literal level, you can say these days are remembered 
And they remember through the actions that we do, through giving gifts to the poor, through give gifts of food, uh, through the meal, through the other things that we do on Purim. But if you actually read the words, it says these days shall be um, remembered and reenacted. Not just in these days you shall do things. So he explains because the days actually, not only do we remember these days, but they actually are reenacted themselves. The days themselves repeat themselves. One of the examples given for it is, for instance, um, uh, when it comes to, let's say, uh, winemaking. I don't know if you know this, but this is not only true with the grapes, it's also true for different produce, that um, even grapes, after they've been cut off from their, vine from their vines, during the period of the year when grapes mature, even the grapes in the barrels that are being done, by, by, that are ready, as I said, they're severed from their source, will feel the same effect that time of the year as the grapes that are actually growing on the vines. Which one would wonder why? They're no longer connected because there is something about that time of year that affects everything, including grapes that have been, as I said, cut off from the tree. In other words, time has an impact on situations even, even when the situation may not no longer be in the same environment. So in that context, when we come tomorrow night, it begins the holiday of Shavuos. <coughs> So the night before, which is tonight, as we enter this Erev Shavuos, it's called. Every holiday has a preparation to it, like Erev Shabbos. It's based on the Talmud that says that everything of value always has boya hachana. Everything of value needs preparation. When you value something, you know you prepare for it. When something is frivolous or meaningless to you, you just run into it without any preparation. Being that Shabbat and holidays are special days, so we have an Erev Shabbos, an Erev Yom Tov, which is actually demonstrates the significance that it's an important day that's coming. So the day before is considered to be a day of preparation, um, like all special things. So we are now entering Erev Shavuos this evening. This is the beginning of the holiday, preparation. So it's appropriate to discuss what exactly, what energy does this holiday bring with it. So it's 3,321 years ago, to be exact. Um, in the tw the year in the Hebrew year 2448, so that would be 3,321 years ago, when the Jews received the Torah at Sinai, which is one of the main primary events that happened on Shavuos. Shavuos is not only that. Shavuos is also, as you may know, from the counting of the Omer, Shavuos is a holiday that's 50 days after Passover. Um, but what happened the fifth, first Passover? 50 days later, they arrived at Sinai. Um, 40, 44 days after. And on the 50th day from the exodus from Egypt, the Jews received the Torah at Sinai as documented in the Bible, the book of Genesis in the chapter Yisrael, documented uh, um, Yisrael, the chapter Yisrael. I said it's documented in the book of Yisrael, in the chapter Yisrael, and, um, and as well as in the... Uh, in Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments, for those of you that are not familiar with the, with the, with, with the Bible. And other uh, so-called popular literature where the Ten Commandments have become an uh, a icon. But it all comes down to something that happened tomorrow. Well, actually, it's really not tomorrow night. It's actually this year, Friday morning, at, at, at dawn, when the Jews received the Torah at Sinai. So this is something that happened 3,321 years ago. The question is, what happens now? We're not in Sinai Desert. We're not standing at Mount Sinai. We read about it. We're told what happened. And uh, we commemorate it. But based on the principle that time is energy, so clearly there was an energy then in the air, and that same energy is now in the air. And like all things energetic, or all things made of energy, energy is a very powerful force and potent force. But it also only as powerful as you uh, access. Energy can come and go. Energy needs containers or so-called channels that draw it down into our lives. So you can have an energy right now in this room. You can have an energy, a person's giving off, exuding an energy, a vibe. And nevertheless, if there's no one receiving it or no one appreciating it, the energy can dissipate. Which is why we celebrate a holiday and why we do certain actions on a holiday, and essentially think of it as the mitzvahs of each particular holiday are like the channels, the containers, that want to ground and concretize and actualize 
the power and energy of that particular holiday. So the focus of this evening will be what is this energy as we stand today, Sinai 2009, how it affects us and how it can help each of us uh, perhaps even create a breakthrough as the first Sinai was a breakthrough of a revelation. So let's first for a moment uh, dissect and discuss what actually, why was Sinai such a big event. Most people will say, those that are in the know, will say because at Sinai God gave the Jewish people, the human race, his mandate, which we call the Torah. You can go a step further. This Torah would become the blueprint for civilization, not just for the Jewish people, but as we stand today in the year 2009, also for a big part of this world. The major Western religions, in Christianity and Islam, all trace their roots back to the Bible. They may have additional texts, additional prophets, but they're all rooted in the Bible, in the Torah. So what happened at Sinai was not just a Jewish event. It's an event that you can say affects directly at least half of this planet. Directly. When you talk about two, two and a half billion Christians and around one and a half billion Muslims. So there you got is already four billion people. And the Jews, as far as proportion goes, is not significant. It's 15 million. So if you talk about three and a half, four billion people, and then when you add into the equation that the Eastern uh, civilization as well, it may be indirectly, but also has many, many parallels with the biblical teachings, and some say even directly because of Abraham's relationship with the East. But regardless, there's no question that uh, what happened at Sinai uh, continues to be, as I will make the case, for being the most single greatest historical event that has shaped all of history. So though we don't necessarily hear it in the news that Shavuos is like the commemoration of the biggest event in history, but the fact is, as I said, at least have this planet follows and at least aspires to follow the, bo the bottom line foundations of the Ten Commandments given through Moses at Sinai to the world. God's rules, God's laws. The level of commitment is not relevant here. Some look at it as a literal event, some see it as metaphorical, some see it as inspirational. That really depends on so-called interpretations that different have different denominations or religious denominations have of the events. But unquestionably that all these religions are based on, they begin with the Ten Commandments. Now, of course, it begins, the, book of, uh, the Torah begins in the book of Genesis with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the stories of Adam and Eve. But I'm talking about as far as a documented, a document, a document, a constitution that would define rules the Ten Commandments is clearly the first classical system. And if you think of it in practical terms, democracy today, as uh, the president, different presidents have written in their, in different statements and so on, the Constitution of the United States, if you break it down to, to its uh, core principles, very much parallel the Ten Commandments. What are the Ten Commandments? So the first one is God. I am your God that took you out of Egypt concept of providence, the concept that uh, we have etched in the currency of the United States and God we trust. The Declaration of Independence puts it that everyone has an inalienable rights, the pursuit of freedom and liberty and so on, and happiness, and it says endowed by the Creator, right? <clears throat> you have in the Ten Commandments, the concept, of course, no signif, not, to steal, not theft, against theft, against murder, against uh, sexual impropriety. So not every civic, there is also in the Ten Commandments keeping Shabbos, honoring your parents. So that may not be constitutional law, but nevertheless, as I said, the main principles of the Ten Commandments, which is essentially a system of law and order and respect of each other's property, each other's bodies, each other's uh, life, is the basis of democracy. If you, want to buy, if you want to put it in context of contrast, you think of it before there was a democ democ democracy ruled this world. In other words, before there were democratic nations. Who decided who, who's, who uh, lives and who dies? Usually an individual, a monarch, a dictator, a fascist, a church. It was controlled by individuals. 
the idea that every person has the right to life, the right to justice, the right to liberty, to freedom, which is only really two, three hundred years old in the scheme of things, is the, funda is the basic principle of the, of the Ten Commandments. Now, Sinai was not just about the Ten Commandments, it's about the entire Torah. So if you're able to sum up the entire Torah, it's about a civilized world based on the first principle of all, as the Founding Fathers recognized, the, the inalienable right of every human being for, to, to make choices, that nobody can impose their choices upon you or me. Even if those choices are wrong, the dignity that each of us has created in the divine image is the foundation of all true, true systems of freedom. Now, there are flaws in our democracy. There are plenty. Look, we have suffering today. Uh, capitalism, arguably, is not necessarily even a, pro a byproduct of democracy, though some argue that it is. But irrelevant to our discussion here, the fact is you see that greed, selfishness, we're not immune to that just because we have a free country. You know, there's still much to be desired. But if you think of it, the contrast, the still the foundations are that we can sit here and choose to speak about what we like and no one's going to arrest us. No one can dictate what we should teach our children, what values to pursue. That is an unshakable, uh, uh, unshakable tenets of this country and of all basic democ democracies no matter what varia variation. And it's become something that has now really taken over almost all of the world. I can't say all of the world. And obviously, Muslim countries' religious law rules. But it definitely has become a force that is no longer just a minority. With the falling of the crumbling of the Soviet Union, there too, even though it's not arguably not a democracy, but certain freedoms have definitely been given there that didn't exist 20, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So if you think about it, where did, all the, where did the principle of this type of freedoms and the basic dignity of every human being's right to choose come from? It's from Sinai, something that happened 3,321 years ago. It's interesting, it took almost three, over 3,000 years for it to become something that's a given. You know, when, they, um, when President Nixon opened up a relationship with China, and China is a closed society for so many years, so the first interviews that uh, the American Western journalists had with Mao Zedong, not Mao Zedong, uh, Chao Enlai, the, who took over from Mao Zedong, who was the first uh, leader after he died. <laughs> um, so they asked him what he thinks about, what's his opinion about the American Revolution, French Revolution. So his response was classic. He said, it's too early to tell. With China being a civilization of 1,000 years to 2,000 years, and the American Revolution, French Revolution of two, three hundred years, it's too early to tell. I was reminded of this when a few years ago in the Lebanon War that Israel got itself stuck in. So everyone said that the Israeli army kept reporting that within three days they'll have the whole southern Lebanon cleaned out and of Hezbollah and all that. But a week dragged on, two weeks dragged on. It was a mess, which really never really ended. Um, so they asked one of the generals, they said, didn't you say in three days... Now it's already three, four weeks since this, since this war is going on and you're not really getting any closer to victory. So he answered, I mean, this was in a dismissive way, but it had the truth to it. He said, what's four weeks in a battle that's raging for 4,000 years? So as I said, it's not really a response to the question, but it's true in a way. Um, so we're dealing here, if you really think in terms, we are, live in a fast food generation where everything's quick. Things don't last quickly. Relationships are almost as uh, last as almost as much fast as, as fast food does in our times, and uh, things don't endure. So we can think in terms of uh, the foundation of this country two, three hundred years ago as being wow, it's centuries old. But when you really think in historical terms, especially speaking from a Jewish perspective, three hundred years is an Im is infancy. Three hundred years after the Sinai was uh, what happened, it, it didn't even take hold yet. It took, as I said, 3,000 years for those principles to become something that today people just take for granted as if it's a God, as, 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 it is a God-given uh, gift. But we take it for granted as if we, we never had to struggle for it. And we did have to struggle. This was not the status quo of, uh, of, of history that people were just considered to be, uh, have, that, uh, have that right to choose, have the right 
to, to live, have the right, not their property shouldn't be confiscated for no reason. Basically, law, a system of law and order. As I said, there's a lot to be desired. We have plenty of law and order still not in place, but at least on paper, the standard is not one that's criminal. Now the question is, can we live up to it? Can we enforce it? But the standard is a major thing. That standard was not a standard for thousands of years. So if you really want to value a holiday like Shavuos, you know, everyone thinks about Passover as like the major holiday. Sukkot people know about joy, Simchus Torah. Shavuot is almost the most insignificant holiday, at least in the context. You still have alternate parking rules are suspended on Shavuot, that yes. <laughs> but beyond that, um, beyond that, well, they're also suspended for the Korean New Year too, you know. Um, beyond that, if you think of holidays that, that, have, that have captured the Jewish consciousness, obviously Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Hanukkah, Passover, Seder, Shavuot, most people don't even know what it means. What happened that day? So it's true, it's a two-day holiday. But Yom Kippur is a one-day holiday. And if you think about it from, in the context of so-called global impact, it's actually Shavuot that has the one that is most directly impacted the world. I'm not suggesting Passover is not. Passover is the concept of freedom, the principles of Passover. What we're talking about is a document. When was this document given? So July 4th is the Declaration of Independence, is the Independence Day, when we celebrate when the, when the Declaration of Independence was enacted. So in a sense, Shavuos is the, really the original July 4th because it's the basis of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. So if you had any Shavuos dinner, you could share this, how Shavuos is the most forgotten and neglected holiday, even though it should be the one that is most heralded because of its uh, practical impact on the world. But beyond that, what I've said here is all true, but beyond that, it really begs the question is, what is it relevance to us personally? This is good on a historical level. It's good to understand and appreciate um, the gifts that we have, where they come from. And for that matter, it's a great opportunity and a, uh, to uh, try to understand the Torah because its principles are such a driving force in life today. But what I want to address as well is on a personal note that there's also more than that happened at Sinai. It wasn't just that divine law was given, a blueprint, how to live a civilized life, a blueprint for civilization, so to speak, was delivered to this world. But something even more profound happened. And I would even say that if you understand the more profound event, you can understand why the Ten Commandments and, the, the, and, the, and Sinai is so significant. You know, why of all the codes of law, there were codes of law written, Hammurabi and others, and later Aristotle, the Greeks that came up, why of all things Sinai still remains such a powerful event, goes back to the story, that, a, story a, a so-called analogy that the Medrash tells about Sinai. And this really, as you'll see, is the key to it all. Before I speak, well, let me study the Medrash and then I'll, I'll explain it. So the Medrash gives an analogy of um, two nations, one living on top of a mountain, one living in a valley. And they never make any contact to each other. As a matter of fact, they have even a, a, a rule, a, ba a barrier, a boundary, that those above will not come down below, and those below do not go up above. A true split. And then something happens that pierces the barrier, and those above come down below, and those below go up above. This is the words of the Medrash. Um, the Medrash actually uses B'nai Remi and B'nai Surya, the Syrians and the Romans. The Romans being up above and the Syrians down below. And then the Medrash uses this, this analogy to explain the significance of Sinai. It says, until Sinai, which means until 3,321 years, years ago tomorrow night, there was an a, uh, invisible barrier, a gzera, which really in Hebrew means a gzera can be both a decree, a gzera also can mean a split, a cut, between, as the Medrash says, between that which was above and that which is below. And at Sinai, for the first time, this split was breached. This uh, barrier was broken. 
And that which is above comes down below, and that which is below goes up above. In contemporary language, it simply means this, that before Sinai there was a split between spirituality and materialism, between what we call matter and spirit. They were not interchangeable. They were not integratable. There's a word like that. Um, they, were not, uh, they were not able to fuse the two. Sinai created in one word fusion, the fusion of matter and spirit. So until Sinai, as the mystics explained this message, you were able to be an ethical person. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and many people who lived before Sinai were very good people. They were great people, tzaddikim. But to actually transform the material world, to take a physical object and turn it into what we call a chefza shel gdusha, which means a sacred object, to make something mundane, secular, turn it sacred, sanctify the secular, was not possible. So spiritual activities were relegated to the world of spirit, and material activities were relegated to the world of, the, of material. Or as using a, a verse in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, he says, Hashemayim shel Hashem, the heaven is to God, va'aretz nitn lebnei adam, and land was given to the human race. Now if you want to just to appreciate what this means, there are actually philosophies based on this principle, which is this material world cannot access the divine. If you want to access the divine, you have to live an ascetic lifestyle. You cannot be immersed in your material interests and the secular world and at the same time be a divine human being. You need to live a monk-like lifestyle, ascetic lifestyle, some way separate yourself. And there are philosophies that actually exist today that are based on this principle. Heaven, you want to go to heaven, you have to shed your material garbs. You want to live in the material world, fine, but your spirituality will be compromised. Spirit, spirit and matter cannot be joined. So based on this, there is also philosophies that say, okay, we can't go to heaven, but at least let's take the material world which we have and do the best we can, a virtuous life, an ethical life. In many ways, by the way, capitalism, which is built on Max Weber and other philosophers and social, sociologists in the 16th, 17th century, is built on Calvinistic thought, which is a, a denomination of Christianity, that what we call the Protestant work ethic. Be an ethical, virtuous person, and through your work, through hard, lab through hard work, through, um, through a, a, a productive life, that's how you connect to God. On the other scale, on the other side of the spectrum, you have spiritual systems that talk about reaching through meditation and through exercises to the most divine places that shed the entire material experience and try to reach beyond Many times, many ways, sometimes, and not to be overly simplistic, Western thought leans more toward trying to fit it into the structures of our being, existence, material world. And Eastern disciplines often focus a lot more on reaching that which is beyond and seeing the material as either a stepping stone or a distraction or even an illusion. I don't want to be overgeneralized because there are variations, obviously, in Western philosophies and religions that have very profound spiritual, and there's also an Eastern that are more, uh, we'll call more immersed in the material world. But in general terms, this, you can make that distinction. So where does Judaism stand? What kind of spiritual, what kind of system is Judaism? So if you ask most people today, most people say Judaism has nothing to do with the soul altogether. As a matter of fact, I remember this class many, many years ago, in the early years when there was a smaller group doing a, 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 more people from the arts and entertainment world, I remember once mentioning, once, I mean, I mention it all the time, but I remember the first time I mentioned the soul. So there's literally a guy in the class, he almost, he, he, was, like, he, sh he was shocked. He says he didn't know that Jews believe there's a soul. I don't know if any of you ever were, found that as a big revelation. I was surprised because I thought, I mean, I, I said to him, what, what, how, could you, if you, how could you have a system of belief and faith and a system that follows some type of higher principles if there's no belief in a soul? So, of course, once I heard his story, 
And then I heard the story of so many of others that were so similar. I realized, he says, Judaism, you have to remember what I know is what I learned in the Bar Mitzvah lessons. So I said, what was that? He says, I learned to shoot kosher spitballs. That was my Bar Mitzvah lessons. That's the way he put it. What he meant by that was, it was meaningless lessons. They taught him to read his Parsha. He had no clue what it said there. There was no discussion about him as an individual. It was uh, basically a meaningless, irrelevant experience. Now, I, knew of, I, know, I know that ma- most Americans, Jews especially, have had such bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah, but it never hits home as when he said, that he says, I never heard there was a soul. First time I heard that human being has a soul, he says, when I went to, a, uh, to, to India and I sat with one of the swamis in the late 60s who told us that we are all souls that travel on this material world. When I heard this, as I said, of course it resonated because then I realized, yes, that's true, it's true. How would he know that Judaism talks about a soul? He never learned necessarily. Even if he learned the beginning of Genesis where it says that God breathed a soul into every person, if you read it literally, it's like, you know, God breathed a breath into everybody and you, you know, it, it sounds so um, ancient, archaic, and irrelevant. The second time he heard the word soul was in the context of music, soul music. How many, how many people will associate soul in that, in, those, in that context with Judaism? All you have to do is watch a Woody Allen film and you'll see how many times soul is mentioned. If anything, it's dismissed. Basically, Judaism, I think religion in general, but Judaism probably suffers more than anything because Jews are skeptics by nature. And they also, when a Jew is a skeptic, it's, it can be of the worst sort. And once you see Judaism become irrelevant, then you dismiss the whole thing as a, a, a dogmatic, ritualistic system of brainless people that have nothing to do with spirituality. And this is a reality that exists today, that religion and spirituality are not seen as two parts of one entity. That's why it's not surprising statistics show that 90 or 95 percent of Americans will say they're somewhat spiritual, have some spirituality in their lives, and only 40% will say that they have any religion in their lives. That's not a small discrepancy. That's like 50% discrepancy. That means basically these two words have nothing to do with each other. If anything, they're antithetical. And I heard this since, when I heard this 25 years ago, um, now that I'm a little less naive, still naive, but less than then, um, it's, very, it's very obvious because ritual is seen as actually a contradiction to spiritual. Why? Because ritual, ritual is about you must do this in a rigid way like this and not like that. Spirituality is always associated with one word, free spirit. A free spirit doesn't have to do anything. There's no rigidity when you're a free spirit. Free spirit, you just go with the flow. You're spontaneous. You go by the energy, in the, in, in, by the mood. Obviously, anyone understands that everything needs some discipline or else it can get out of control. But who would associate ritual with the spiritual system, even though spiritual is just a SPI in front of the word ritual? But they are two opposites, at least in people's perception and in people's experience. And then you add into the equation, and I don't like to go into one of my uh, ramblings, anti-Orthodox ramblings, but I, but I always am tempted to. And then you meet people who are very ritualistic and very rigid in their observance, meticulous, every letter of the law, how they eat matzah on Passover and what they don't eat. And when it comes to human refinement, you don't see a more refined human being. Sometimes you see the more religious, the more obnoxious, the more condescending, the more judgmental. So what's the logical conclusion of that? That religious observance has nothing to do with being a more refined spiritual human being. It's another selfish expression, except this one does it through indulging in one way. This one indulges in religion, religious activity. Now, people don't always spell it out this way, but that's exactly how I see it. And sadly, this is like everything opposite of what actually happened at Sinai. So with this perspective, Judaism then, has not, it doesn't even fit on the map. What I described before, Calvinistic thinking, the Protestant work ethic, one way to bring God into the world is through a virtuous life in the material world. The other extreme, let's say, is living a life, an ascetic lifestyle, where you reject the material world in order to access the spiritual truths that can only be accessed when you go beyond the material trappings of life and ego and vanity. 
So those are two extremes. Where does Judaism fit into this? It doesn't even fit on the map. Why? Because religion seems to be just a ritualistic experience that doesn't necessarily have a soul in it. Where does it fit? You know, uh, the, real, the real cynic would say it's just a thing people are hold on to. They've been programmed. You know, read a little Christopher Hitchens and some of our other new, lately popular atheist writers or agnostic writers. And they have a good point because many of the people they meet are exactly that, brainless, mindless, following rules without any uh, ability to explain it, or, as I said, doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily see deeper refinement in someone that is more observant. So the conclusions are obvious, that one thing has nothing to do with the next. So what I'm here to tell you is that all this may be true empirically based on people's behavior, but has nothing to do with Judaism. What Judaism truly is, and what really happened at Sinai, to go back to the Medrash, what happened at Sinai was a power was released, an energy, as I mentioned, that gives us the ability to fuse material and the spiritual, matter and spirit, which means that the disciplines of ritual are not just some type of divorced acts of, uh, of, ape, of, of people a a aping each other and clones of just following some rules, they're actually a, a, a profound discipline to help us spiritualize this world. The fact that there's a discipline involved shouldn't surprise anyone. Take music. We talk about music and soul. Music also has a structure. There's a thing called musical notes. There are only that many musical notes on the scale. The most brilliant innovator can't come and suddenly say, I discovered a new musical note. It's ridiculous. Because the sound barrier, the sound structure is, 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 this is the structure. However, when you learn the discipline of these notes, you can, there are infinite combinations how they can be played. You could have one person play the same notes and it sounds like a, uh, pardon, a, a funeral. And another person plays the same notes and it sounds like, a, like, a, like angels. Same notes. So music has a structure, but its purpose is not structure. The discipline of musical notes is in order for us to use them to defy structure, actually, to transcend structure. And the same thing is with mitzvahs. A mitzvah, in its sense, in essence, what it means, the translation of the word mitzvah is not ritual. It's not even commandment. It's not rules. The word mitzvah comes from the root, believe it or not, from the root, believe it or not, connection. That's what a mitzvah is. Tzav sevechibur, it's a connection. It's a whole different world when you hear something as a connection. It's not a commandment, merely a commandment, a law, a, uh, an edict, a uh, tenet. It is a connection. Connection means it's connecting two things. What is a mitzvah connecting? It's connecting matter and spirit. To use a simple example, let's take the mitzvah of tzedakah, charity most basic one of all. You earn money, hopefully more than less, especially in our economy. Right? You have a mitzvah that from the money you earn, you should give some to charity, to those less fortunate than you. What is the significance of this mitzvah? And if you want the source for it, look it up in Tanya in chapter 37, a brilliant, profound chapter on the, on the essence of what a mitzvah is. It says like this, money is a, you can say, even the epitome of materialism. In, in our money, we find the symbol of all our life energy. The time we've invested, our ingenuity, our creativity. That's what money is, a symbol of all of that. And when you give a piece of it to someone to help them, you're taking essentially all of materialism as it's represented in money, all of its vanity, all its ego, all of its self-contained, self-interest-driven power, and you're weakening it by helping another person with that which you've earned, which is precisely why charity is the hardest mitzvah of all. Because it's taking what you, what you, what you, all your value, everything you feel you are important, and you're saying, why would I give it to someone who hasn't earned it? And the answer is because it's the right thing to do. It's the mitzvah to do. You, by, in effect, what you do is you weaken the tentacles of materialism and you essentially sublimate and spiritualize the material. You spiritualize the money through turning it into a, a force that's also helping other people. Every mitzvah does the same thing. 
You take a piece of food, you make a blessing on it, the food sustains you. The blessing says it's not just sustenance in order to self-indulge because you need to live, but it's also to recognize that the strength that you get from the food that you eat should be used to, build, to make this world a more constructive, a better place. You can use the same energy to hurt other people. It's appreciating every act in the material world that we do, from how we eat, how we sleep, how we love, how we're born, how we die, how we make more money, our health, everything. 630 mitzvahs cover the entire spectrum of material life. And as I said, connection. It's a connection of your material life with a, with a more spiritual place. It's essentially, as I said, fusing matter and spirit. The power to do so was given to us at Sinai. And that's what the Medrash means, that till then there was a breach. There was a, I'm sorry, a schism between above and below, between spirit and man, between heaven and earth. At Sinai, heaven kissed earth, and earth kissed heaven for the first time, but it gives us the ability to, to bring them together. So if you ask in, the, in that context, what is Judaism's position on this Western, Eastern uh, approach to spirituality and materialism, the answer is the best of both worlds. Judaism believes not in asceticism. You have to immerse in this material world. Within it lie embedded in the words of the capitalists, divine sparks. Each of us in our lifetime is allocated a certain amount of those sparks. Where are those sparks embedded? In, the, in, the, in your life's opportunities. The places you'll travel to, the people you know, the opportunities that will arise, your skills. Every one of us has our uh, traje traje what do you say? Traje trajectory. trajectory, right. Every one of us has our journey. And it's different than other journeys. We may intersect. There may be places on the journey where we travel together. But the whole picture of your life will have its own trajectory, will have its own paths, its own twists and turns. And the magic of that, the beauty of that is that those unique twists and turns, even the challenging ones, for that matter, are your unique sparks that were given to you, that were allocated to your soul when it came down to this earth, to find those sparks, redeem them, elevate them. And when you do so, you fuse the material part of your life with the spiritual part of your life. And there are obviously countless examples. I gave a few, another one. You travel somewhere. Say you're traveling, summer's coming up, many of us travel. You go somewhere, you may be going for vacation, get away, meet friends, family, whatever the ostensible excuse reason it is. You have many good reasons. What the Baal Shem Tov will say about it is that based on the verse in the, in the, in the Psalms from King David, Ma'ashem etzad the gover kenanu, God leads the footsteps of a human being, and if he can't get you to go there consciously, he's going to get you to go there unconsciously, which means if a little angel came to you and said, listen, you've got to go to this and this city because there are spiritual sparks that you were allocated to you for you to redeem, you say, listen, I don't have time right now. Maybe when I retire or when I find some free time, I'll go do this. Now I'm too busy. So what God does, he sets up a situation that you have either a business opportunity in that location or friends tell you it's a great vaca vacation spot or some other excuse, a simcha, you have to go there for, to, for someone's wedding or, or some holiday. So you're so-called, when you look at that, oh, business opportunity, suddenly you have time. And so you make the schedule and you go there. That was just to get you there. Once you're there, now that we have you there, so to speak, now the time is to really discover the true reason that you're there, which is essentially a lesson in humility that when you come to a place, don't always think the biggest reason you're there is because you why, you, why you think you're there. The greatest things in life will happen when you don't have, plan them actually, spontaneously. You just have to open yourself up to it. Unfortunately, I see many times people, the answers to their prayers, the answers to their biggest questions are, are, are given to them and provided to them, except they have, they have their own plans and their own plans are getting in the way. If you just allow a little opening that maybe it's not only your plan, maybe allow something fresh, something new, something unplanned, you'd be surprised what kind of answers you'd get to things that you are asking for. So when you go to a place, yes, okay, so do the business or do the, reason, the reasons that you felt that you went there. Fine, fulfill them. But also be open to meet a new person, to hear something, 
Don't just be trapped in your own schedules. And you'll see those spontaneous, those unexpected things, sometimes are the greatest, uh, the greatest experiences that can come out of them. It's because these are the sparks that lie hidden in your traje traje trajectory. I have to experiment. I like the word. Okay. And your journey. It's easier to pronounce. So Sinai then is much more than just a mandate that was delivered 3,321 years ago. I also like to say that. It sounds good. 3,000 years. It's like a long time. Um, a lot has happened since. Right? It's not just a mandate of a blueprint of morality and ethics that was given to us, as I discussed earlier this evening. That too. But above all, something much more profound happened. An actual door, a channel opened up that allows us to fuse alienim and tachtenim, that which is above and that which is below, heaven and earth, soul and body, spirit and matter. And, um, and they should not be like two worlds, but it should be like one seamless whole. That's its power. So then when you think of the Ten Commandments and the other mitzvahs in the Torah that were given at Sinai, it's much more than just giving civilization to the world, which is by no means a small thing as well. That, I too, is, is, as I said earlier, a major achievement. But if it's also the power to actually transform this world, imagine what kind of power that is. So there will be people who know that Shavuos, this holiday that is beginning tomorrow night, is the holiday when civilization was born. And it would take thousands of years for it to take hold in our world. But much fewer know that it's also the day when the power to actually transform a material world into a spiritual environment was also born. That was what really happened. And that's what I said earlier. I would submit that the reason the Ten Commandments and Sinai became such a powerful force is not just because it was a good blueprint, a good beginning of the Declaration of Independence. It was because it actually does something even more than that. It's one thing to say that we live in a material world and we can civilize it. Because you could even argue from an evolutionary perspective, survival of the fittest, it's in our self-interest to be civilized. Why? Because if you can kill me, I can kill you, and we have, uh, we have a jungle. So selfishness dictates that we should have some laws called green lights and red lights, where we at least, you know, if everyone's driving all the time, all the direction, we won't get anywhere. So no one likes to stand by a red light, but in case you ever get nervous at a red light, at least say to yourself, if, there was no, if, there was, if I was driving the other way, there would be a, a green light. And at some point, your light will also change. I understand some people are so selfish, they, want their, they, they should only have green lights all the time. But it doesn't work that way. You have to give up a bit in this world. So next time you have a little road rage, think about that. Um, but that is driven, in other words, civilization can be, you could argue, is good, is good even for the selfish person. Because ultimately it creates an environment where Dog doesn't just, it's not dog eats dog. We're not there yet, as we've witnessing it time and again, but at least in concept. Now, why it took thousands of years for, civilization, for this so-called the selfish gene to discover that civilization is good for us, that I'll let evolutionary biologists argue with the religious uh, uh, fundamentalists. You know, why that's the case. And they could, they could battle it out, or they won't battle it out. They won't, uh, it's a perpetual battle, let's put it that way. But regardless, that, that argument can be made. But then you can think of, it in that, if you think of it in that way, it's really almost disconcerting because you say to yourself, all this civilization that sounds so noble, all, men are cre all people are created equal, endowed by the divine uh, creator with equal rights, pursuit of liberty, freedom, happiness, you know, sounds such beautiful romantic concepts. It all comes down to it, just another... Me mechanism of evolution to get selfish people to coexist and survive. You know, it renders it into a very uh, so-called brutal uh, type of uh, system that's about uh, civilization is good for the species to survive. So survival of the fittest dictates that we get along with each other. How, uh, how, how beautiful is that? Um, when you understand, however, that Sinai has another dimension to it, which is it's not just about creating civilization and figuring out how to survive in a jungle, in a material world. There's something much deeper going on. There is a true ability to transform the material world into a divine environment. 
that even though ostensibly to the naked eye, spirit and matter seem like um, dichotomous, you know, spirit and matter is always seen as two worlds, the spiritual and the material. It's again, just as Einstein discovered just over just 100 years ago, a century ago, that time is energy, he also discovered the most famous of all equations, E equals MC squared, that manage, matter and energy are interchangeable, are reversible. Or more bluntly, that matter is energy and energy is matter. The fact that it looks like a table, put it under the right conditions. Throw this table into a fire and it turns into fuel to give off light and energy. So this table will become energy if it's if the if its basic elements are broken down through uh, through enough heat, go even further through nuclear fission or fusion, and you can release from this table, even from the strand of a hair, hair strand of hair, an unbelievable power, potent power that can actually destroy this universe. It doesn't make sense to people with naked eyes like ours. No one would ever have imagined that. Once upon a time, size did matter, so to speak. The more, the more powerful, the, more, the larger it had to be. A larger army was the more powerful army. The, larger, the ones with the most um, firepower were the ones that are the strongest. Today that's not the true at all. You give one person on this earth the power to create a nuclear explosion and he or she will be more powerful than the largest armies with all their weapons. Because it's not about size. It's about energy that lies sometimes in the smallest things. On a biological level, for instance, it's also true. Before we understood or knew there was a world called DNA, cells, and so on, so the body was seen as a bunch of organs, some organs more important than others, more powerful than others. Today we know that a human body has at least 75 trillion cells, and if one cell, God forbid, is mutant, one mutation can create such havoc that unimaginable, that one cell of 75 trillion, because it's not about quantity any longer. Now, even though we know this today, because this is common stuff that every school child knows, but it's still counterintuitive. When you think about it, we still worship size and image and the physical world, because our minds tell us it's true. But still, we are, we are affected. As much as people say, don't judge a book by its cover, everybody does. That's why they, they spend millions or billions of dollars in, in, in designing covers. If no one judged book by covers, you wouldn't have that whole industry. And image counts and packaging counts. They put much more energy into certain packages than the product inside of it. That's why you'll sometimes come home with a whole package, you, you dig and dig, and then you find that little thing inside there. It's all part of the experience, right? The unwrapping and the whole thing. Now, I'm not trying to be cynical. It's true. That's, we are human beings. And we do live in a material world. And it does seem ultimately dichotomous. But if you think of it from a scientific perspective, or every time think of your computer, look at your television. What do you think is really happening? Images are being transmitted into your living room or dining room or now everywhere, basically. That could be a million miles away, 10,000 miles away, simultaneously. How is it getting to you? Through what? So whether it's wireless or wires, frankly, really makes no difference. Not a wire and not wireless can really explain how an image, a full image of something happening is getting to you. You can see it and millions of others can see it while it's happening somewhere completely far away. Because there's invisible forces that are at work that have scientific explanations, whether it's radio waves, light waves, the different, uh, the, the, the whole um, um, subatomic forces that are at work beneath the surface. And we, our lives, are, have been changed by these forces. But still, as I said, we're still trapped in the material world. Someone comes over to you and says something that touches or insults your vanity, you're going to be affected by it. We are still affected and stimulated by external things, by superficial things. So there's work to be done. But what happened at Sinai was the power unleashed that you could actually fuse, or more importantly, recognize that spirit and matter are really not two worlds. That's a whole different thing than just saying you could civilize a jungle, or you can take people and show them how in their self-interest it's important to live side by side. 
in peace. You actually, it says that the material world is not what it appears to be. This is, even though it's a selfish world and people behave selfishly, fundamentally beneath it all, there's a spiritual force at work and it's our mission to reveal that force. So the concept, the belief in a utopian world where one day spirit and matter will be one and spirit will dominate over the material is absolutely quintessentially Jewish. This is actually the belief of Mashiach. This is what, this is what the belief of a geula, of a redemption. Redemption from what? Redemption from the slavery and the trap that we think spirituality and material are separate from each other. This all took place in one revelatory moment, one moment of fusion at Sinai, when the Bible says that God came down on the mountain and Moses went up. Obviously, God is everywhere, so where did he, he come from exactly? It's symbolic and metaphorical to tell us that spirit and matter fused for that moment and then opened up a door that we can always achieve the same thing. Now, what this means, what this means on a personal level, as I said, time is energy. So now we are in Shavuos, coming up to this holiday for the 3,321st time. How many times did I say that already tonight? I didn't say 3,321 times. That I know. That'll take some uh, time. Um, it tells us something extremely profound. And this, after one little introduction. In Jewish thought, there's a concept of, especially in mystical thought, the Kabbalah, of microcosm, macrocosm, which means everything that happens in the larger world happens inside of us, and vice versa. We are essentially a microcosm of the universe. Elam katan adam. The human being is a small universe. And there's actually midrashim, there are different texts that, lay, that spell out the parallels of every aspect of the universe, from the mineral world, the vegetable the animal, and all the different gradations of the material universe, how they reflect inside the human being. We have things that grow. We have things that we have mineral. We have an animal inside of us. We have all kinds of forces that we have mountains and valleys, the Medra says. We have um, deserts and we have um, uh, rainforests. Everything exists inside the human being. So if you look at the material world, the natural world, you can find some macrocosm of it within, outside of ourselves. Actually, it would be an interesting study, maybe even a multimedia project to do this type of parallel, just to show. Which One of the reasons for this is because the concept of an integral unity that connects everything, as I said, the unity between matter and spirit. So integral unity di dictates that the universe would be like a hologram where everything is everything, basically. Everything reflects in everything else. So it really is a, it is a, it's a manifestation of a fundamental unity that runs through everything. If you're familiar with some quantum mechanics, this shouldn't surprise you at all. The concept of whether it's a string theory or other theories that say that there's an integral unity that connects everything. And that's why all structures are really symbols of each other. So in that sense, all of us, each of us, has the entire universe within us. But there's another significance, significant element in this, and that is the significance of responsibility. Because we are allocated, each of us, divine sparks, or we'll call it spiritual opportunities, that will come our way in our lifetimes, so that universe exists within you. When you refine a part of yourself and your personality, you, in effect, are refining a part of this universe. And vice versa. When we in some way improve the world around us, we are improving ourselves as well. In other words, we are in a symbiotic relationship with the world around us. We and the environment, you and the environment are one. Not just that you have to protect it because it's the world in which you live. It is you and you are it. We're not outside of it. We are part of the environment. We are shaped by it and it's shaped by us. This is, as I said, fundamental Jewish thought, which sounds very progressive today. But this was always known to be the case. That's why you have, for instance, a law in the Torah of Baal Tashkis. You're not allowed to damage anything in this universe. To the extent that when one of the Rebbes, when he was a little child, was walking with his father in the, in the woods, and as they were talking, the, the child inadvertently took and ripped off a, um, a leaf from a, a branch, from a, from a tree. 
and began rubbing it. You know, who hasn't done that? Rubbing it. And his father reprimanded him and said, what right do you have to tear off this leaf from the, leaf from the tree? Basically disrupting its whole life. Now you think one leaf among billions. That's not the way it works. As I said, it's not about size. It's not about numbers. And we have no right to just damage something just because it seems insignificant to us. It's a lesson in sensitivity. It's also a lesson, as I said, in the symbiosis between us and the environment and the world. So microcosm, macrocosm. Based on that, whatever happened at Sinai 3, 000, 3, over three millennia ago, it's not overdue, it, um, and happens, recreates itself every year, this energy, this time of year, happened not just on a collective level that matter and energy were, for, were fused, but also on a personal level because we are a macrocosm, microcosm of the macrocosm, a microcosm of all the events around us. In effect, what I'm saying is that tomorrow night, an energy will enter this universe that not only recreates, like the spiral, that energy of fusion that happened that many years ago at Sinai the first time, but also personally, there will be a Sinai revelation inside each of us. What does this mean? Well, let's think, talk a moment about unity in our own lives. How many of you would describe yourself as unified psyches? And how many would define ourselves as fragmented human beings? Now let me spell out what it means. Um, you know, fragmented means that you're a composite of many pieces and you don't know which one should dominate in your life. I mean, basically when we say that I'm being tugged in a thousand different directions or even two different directions, this can be the battle between our minds and our hearts. Your mind tells you to do one thing and your heart tells you to do another. It can be the battle between temptation and, uh, and sanity. Or let's put it more bluntly, sanity and insanity. We all battle those two forces all the time. We feel a little insane from time to time. And we have other forces that tug at us. The battle between our home lives, our personal lives, and our professional lives. Should we focus on a job? Should we focus on a relationship? And in the relationship itself, there's plenty of voices, one way or the other. We have basically, we live in a world of splintered psyche. All kinds of different things going on. It is the great blessing of a person to be able to find peace. Peace, I mean, I don't just mean peace because in the term of peace, like in pieces. Peace that you're able to uh, so-called silence some of your voices. But true peace in shalom, in Hebrew, the word peace means complete. Some people see peace as the absence of war. If at least I don't have war today, I already feel at peace. That's not peace. That's the absence of war. That would be like love being the absence of hatred. I know many people would uh, vie for that. If at least I have no hatred, I'd also feel good. But peace and love means much more than the absence of the opposite. Peace is an entity, a force of its own, a being of its own. It's an integral unity that connects everything inside of you. Now, is this even doable? You could see, an argument could be made that a human being by nature, just like the material world by nature, as I said, microcosm, macrocosm, is fundamentally made up of different voices, different parts. Not necessarily multiple personalities, but uh, close to that, because we have many different needs. You, know, you need to work in order to make money. You need to make money in order to pay your bills. There's no way that in 24 hours of the day you're going to have to give up some time to do work even though you'd rather be with someone you love or rather do something you love. So you'll sometimes you'll compromise yourself and work in an area that is not necessary of your liking because there's no choice. So that's part of the so-called negotiation that each of us goes through on a daily basis in our lifetimes. Where you give something up for something else. And it's a question of ba a balance and juggling act. Is this truly our destiny? That's the question. Are we really trapped in that sense of being a victim of circumstances in that way? So without Sinai, you could argue absolutely. You can make the best of it, as I said before, like the Protestant work ethic. You could take your life and clean out as much garbage as you can, get rid of extra stuff, and try to live as, 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 a, as a virtuous, wholesome life as possible. But ultimately, true integration is impossible. 
This is true if we are fundamentally a fragmented uh, universe and we are fundamentally fragmented creatures. But if there is truly an integral unity that lies behind it all, and matter and spirit are not two, then really there's a unity that lies within you that if you could access it, your work and home are not two forces. They're two manifestations of one truth. And that's what Sinai came to contribute in our personal lives. What that means, let's put it, let's use a business terminology. I've used this example many times. No business can function without a mission statement. The question is, can you function without one in your personal life? If a business can't, how can you? Now, why can't a business function without a mission statement? Very simple, because a business requires many components, many different people, people who may have different agendas or who do have different agendas. And the mission is, in a sense, the cohesive force, the purpose of why we're all coming together to achieve something. Take away the mission, everyone will be going their own direction. Everyone may be even thinking they're fulfilling the mission, but nothing keeps it together. And they will go off in different directions. How do we know that? Because even companies with mission statements go off in different directions. So you have to have people who are on top of it all the time, sometimes even people who think that with good intentions, and even with, the, with the, the seriously invested that the company should succeed, sometimes you try something, you realize it's not really our mission, we went off. Not an easy thing to align many forces, many people, even yourself, all your different moods and all your different strengths toward one direction. So that's why it's critical. You have to have a short, strong mission statement. Google's mission statement, I did my studies, my research, is, uh, I don't know exact wording, but the content is, the, ta the, the essential gist of it is to organize all the information of the world and make it accessible to everyone or something like that. And they never waver from that mission. And if you go through every department and every research, and remember they have, I don't know how many employees, and they're giving them the freedom of 20% of their time to be creative and come up with their own ideas, it's, it's an amazing thing to keep it all aligned that it still fulfills the core mission. And as soon as they won't, it'll affect the bottom line because resources begin to be spent, one, resources can be wasted, etc. Microsoft's mission, if I recall correctly, is a computer in every home and in every office. You think, what does that have to do with Microsoft? Yeah, but you see, if you want a computer in every home and every office, you have to create applications that make it indispensable for your home life and your work life. So Microsoft's mission is to create software to make sure that there's a computer in every home and in every office. So all their software fulfills that mission. Sometimes it takes 10 years to develop a mission statement and billions of dollars. And still you're not always right. So the question is, if a company can't function without a mission statement, how can we? So the answer, my friends, is we can't. However, we can deceive ourselves that we are functioning. It's called a functional addict. How? Because you see, in a company, there's a thing that keeps everybody honest, ultimately, which is the bottom line. If you waver away from your, off your mission, resources will begin to be spent. At some point, debts will grow, and the debtors will come knocking at your door. In your personal life, who do we have accountability to? If your life isn't working, there's no bank there's no foreclosure. There's nothing happening that has any impact. All the impact is only internally. In other words, instead of exploding, it implodes. So think of this exercise. You could try it out if you have the courage. Take any day, take today. At the end of the day, you get home tonight. Take a piece of paper and list everything you did today, if you can even remember, if you want to remember. Another thing. Which means from the moment you woke up, everything. Woke up, you, you, you press the snooze button once, twice, whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> you exercised, showered, breakfast, got dressed. And the order here is not specific. Didn't get dressed. Um, commuted, went to work, coffee break, tea break, another coffee break, another coffee break, lunch. Um, gossip. And a few maybe important meetings. I'm just giving you an example. Then go through the day. Came home, came to this class. <laughs> if, if, if you're uh, those that are going to list that. And then try to, um, and then all the way to the moment you go to sleep. 
Then try to take a line, a thread, and see how many of these items, let's say it could usually come out around 100, 120 items. I've tested. How many of these items are connected to each other? From tying your shoelaces to reading the newspaper at night, what connection do they have? So some will be means to the end. You commuted in order to, in order to get to work. You, you, you took a taxi to go shopping. You, you went shopping to buy clothes that you needed or you didn't need. So you have few things that will connect. You'll discover that you have so many loose threads, a bunch of fragments. So you may think, so what? Big thing. So I have a bunch of fragments. But now let's accumulate cumulative uh, theory here. These fragments add up today, tomorrow, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, century after century, millennia after millennia. We've gone through a millennium. Nine years ago. Okay. Now, if you add it all up, it's millions and millions of fragments. So you could still say, so what? So I have fragments. But human beings abhor fragmentation. Even the most disorganized person abhors a certain amount of disorganized. You know. A lot of people that we think consider to be disorganized don't think they're disorganized. I remember my father, extremely organized person, but his desk, you couldn't see him on his desk because he had literally papers that went all the way. And I'd say to him, Todd, where do you, how do you know where anything? He says, ask me what, what you're looking for. So I tell him, and he said, right here, he'd pull out the paper. He had this, this way of, in his mind, this was organization. Or as some say, if a, if a, if a cluttered desk is a sign of a cluttered mind, what is an uh, empty desk a sign of, as some would put it. On the other hand, in time management and other courses, you learn one thing on your desk at a time. There's a different, different people, different styles. Different folks, different strokes for different folks, as they say. But my point is that ultimately no one likes fragmentation. The question is how much we can tolerate, and the question is whether we see it as fragmented. Maybe for us it's a form of order. <clears throat> the human beings abhor chaos. Look at little children. Without any education, give, give young children uh, objects of different sizes and shapes. And they will naturally, without anyone telling them to, fit spheres into spheres, circles into circles, squares into squares, rectangles into rectangles. There's a natural gravitation to connect things. That's how the mind works. You don't need to be trained. Training helps shortcuts. Training can help uh, create a some, some, some certain science to it, formulas that make it easier. But the human being naturally gravitates towards some form of order. Which means, essentially, that our spirit cannot tolerate fragmentation. So if you think this fragmentation that accumulates is meaningless, you can think again. No wonder that people get, have conf are confused, can get depressed, can get what we call being aimless, or the middle-aged blues. Today, middle age keeps getting younger and younger. When you have an overabundance of stimulation, of different voices and different forces, it has to wear you down. Now, if you have a high tolerance level, you can tolerate more. That doesn't mean it's working. It just means you're able to tolerate more until the breaking point. So the idea of having a mission statement in our personal lives is just as critical even more than in business. The only thing is, as I said, in business, there's accountability to others in your own life who you're accountable to. So here is the answer of Sinai to that problem. You begin the morning by saying, Moda'ani is an exercise. We say in the morning, Modani, a short little prayer that says, I thank you for returning my soul to me. The soul is your mission. Actualizing your soul in this world. Finding those sparks that are hidden and embedded in your life that are allocated to you is your mission. Everything else is means. And when you focus on that every morning, you begin and say, look, the center of my life, the hub, is my soul. And everything else is a spoke then you begin creating a force that connects all those dots. So then, yes, you could have 100, 120, you could have 1,000 items a day, but you can connect them all. Are they helping me fulfill the mission of my life, the soul, actualization in this world? This is what Sinai did personally for each of us. It opened up a door that you can, create, you can access the inner unity between the matter and spirit in your own life, between the different voices and forces that 
tug at us in different directions. But the the key the key element is 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 identifying the hub, the soul, and not allow any other force to distract you. That's going to be difficult, because the fact is most of us are not living soul lives. We're living a life either by necessity, or by habit, trapped in the in the forces that tomorrow morning. You must answer to people, employees, employers, relationships, healthy, not healthy, this, the ghosts and the voices of your parents haunting you, personal childhood experiences that shape us. We are trapped in many, many ways that are, that are pulling at us. So it's not as simple as it sounds. It requires work to get, first of all, identify your soul. And secondly, to hold on for your dear life to it and not let other forces become the dominating element. That's the power of Sinai. It gave us power. Because on our own it would be impossible to do. Because we do get distracted and we do get seduced by the world around us, as I mentioned. So on a personal level, what happened at Sinai 3,321 years ago, and what happens will happen again, recreate itself tomorrow night in this holiday, is there will be a revelation inside your soul. If you're receptive, and you allow it to speak, you'll hear it. Now that I told this to you, you no excuses. But now you have to pay attention. There's a voice that will open up and say things to you. I know this is not so spooky as it sounds. It doesn't mean an actual voice. It means a spirit. It means an energy. Which is one of the reasons we go, the Nedra says we go and hear the Ten Commandments on this year will be on uh, Friday morning. It says in Medjur that when we stand and hear the Ten Commandments read, in the chapter in Yisrael, when we hear it read in the Torah during the holiday, literally it says, as if you're standing at Sinai that, those many years ago. Which means it's, re, it's, it's happening again. But you have to be there. You have to show up, and you have to also allow yourself to hear. Which means, no matter what your fragmentation of your life, no matter how split your material and spiritual is, this Shavuos, you will have a new power that will enter into your being, that will enter into the general cosmos, and what we have to do is obviously hold on to it and make sure it stays with us. Hold it, 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 to, to, to hear the voice is one thing. To maintain it is going to be the bigger challenge, which is why we have a class next week to talk about that. But uh, meanwhile, the first step is first to open ourselves up to it. And you'd be surprised because it always is that way. The soul is like a, think of it as an, a, a, an enormous reservoir of power. But a reservoir like a well that's beneath the surface, if you don't put down, a, if you don't dig, and you don't lower a pail, you will not be able to access its water. It's there. So the soul is rich with, with, with resources and with, um, with the tools and with everything we need to access this inner unity that I'm describing. But you have to do something about it. You have to dig, which is not always that easy. It means you have to get rid of some of the layers that block the weeds that block the flowers that are beneath the surface. And then you have to create a pail, some vase, some vessel, some container. And that's through action. That's through the action, whether it's the action of listening to the Torah being read, whether it's inviting a friend to a meal, whether it's talking to someone about it, whether it's studying, whether it's acts of charity or virtue that are conducive to this prayer. I mean, the list goes on. Whether it's moda'ani, even if you've said it, maybe you start saying it, with a new intention, with a new passion. Um, you can start tomorrow morning too, for that matter. Which is, in other words, focusing in on the soul of your soul and the soul within your life. And remember, in everything you do, even those things that seem to be so petty and so distracting, like your work, commuting. I mentioned commuting, tying your shoelaces, no shoelaces, whatever it is. Each of them has embedded divine sparks waiting to be released. So there's nothing in your life, even the things that seem so trivial, seem so mundane, that are, um, that are uh, exempt from your soul's mission. So it's not like the soul is in one place and the other things are in somewhere else and you have no choice but to do them. That's one attitude. That's what I said before is the attitude of working with what you got and do the best you can. Sinai says no. There's a fundamental unity amidst, amongst, amidst every aspect of our lives. And more importantly... It really is all one. But you have to find that common denominator, which is the soul of the matter, which is within it all, because spirit and matter ultimately are really one. They just have taken two different shapes. 
two different ways of expression. So we have the ability to get to that place. So it's not just making the best with what we have, to actually find and spiritualize every detail, every aspect of our lives. That is the power that happens on Shavuos. And energy enters into this universe that was never here before. It's, it's, it, it parallels and, in a sense, recreates the original energy, but it's in a new plane, it's in a new way, because it's, it's a new year. But it's the same type of energy, and it's an energy that enters in each of us. So it's not just a Sinai revelation for the collective, but also for the individual, for you and I, in a personal way. You read the Ten Commandments, you listen to them, you'll see they're not written in the plural. It doesn't say in Hebrew, Anoichi Hashem Alekeichem, Kabed Esavichem. In Hebrew, when you say you to a group, you use a different word than when you say you to an individual. You say Shalom Alecha, uh, you say Alecha, you're talking to someone as an individual. Alechem, if it's to a group. In English, when you say you, I can mean you, all of you. I can mean you as an individual. In Hebrew, it's not that way. So if there were millions of Jews standing at Sinai, it should have said, Anechi Hashem Alekeichem. I am your God, Alekeichem, the plural, the group. It says Alekecha. So the Medrash answers because each person standing there heard it as if it was being spoken to him or to her, as if no one else was there. In other words, it was completely personalized, customized. Something what some websites are trying to uh, simulate, uh, simulate, if you want a, an example. Um, the personal experience. You know, welcome uh, to your name, so on. But this was actual real, that it was speaking to each individual soul, and that soul, and each soul heard it, what it had to hear, unique and personalized and customized to each person. That's how the commandments, and that's why on Shavu is the same thing. It's not just on the collective, the power of uh, this fusion, but on an individual level, the things you will specifically need, that not necessarily I need, or someone else needs, that will be the revelation that you will get. And this is, a, this is guaranteed to us, that on Shavu is that's the power of the holidays. That is why it's worth celebrating these holidays. They're not just commemorative, as I said. It's the days where we're nostalgic and try to remember what happened once upon a time ago. Or as that guy that said that nostalgia is not like what it used to be. It's not that way. It's about now and here and now, about recreating it in our lives today and empowering us to face the challenges that we all will have, um, in our, will have and will have throughout, uh, throughout this year and throughout our lives. So... I want to therefore wish everybody a very happy Shavuos since we're going right into it from this class tonight. But tomorrow there won't be any classes because of the holiday. We will resume next Wednesday. And it should be a real powerful fusion for each of you. As I said, we will compare notes next Wednesday night. So please come prepared. <laughs> Let me know what happened. Uh, and again, I don't mean voices that uh, should haunt you or voices that uh, should uh, spook you. It should be a healthy instinct that will emerge if you allow it to. So you have to wash away some of the outer layers and let your soul speak to you at least for a day or two. And that is the best way to celebrate the Shavuos. There are also those that eat dairy products like cheesecake. You may wonder how does that connect to all of this. That's for another time. And that's not this discussion here. I want to wish everyone a great happy holiday. I want to wish Stephanie a happy birthday. Um, Simcha Yael, Bad Tinder, right? Okay. The birthday is Sivan the 5th, so it's today, right? And, and I wish everybody here, those that don't, that, those birthdays that I don't know of, there are people sometimes here that have other birthdays or other significant dates. If you let me know, I'd be happy to honor that as well. And also send you a little birthday kit. So I will we'll send you something. I have a little gift that we'll send. Have your email, right? Yeah, good. Um, tell Golden Malka to remind me. We'll send Stephanie. Okay? And um, uh, and as I said, a happy holiday to everybody. We should only have simchas, good, good activities, good joy. And please access us through the web, whether it's meaningfullife.com or leave us your email address, many ways that we can connect. Above all, personally, that's, of course, the best of all. So I wish everyone, bid everyone a good night and a uh, good day for those that are in the other parts of the time zones. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, um, and good night. Yes, again. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night.